Hello and welcome. Welcome to each and every one of you to our broadcast for today. Whether you're joining us for the first time or you are regular on this program, a big, big, big welcome to you. I got a word for you today from the Word of God. Please stay where you are and get ready to be impacted by the truth. Silencing day and night accusers. That is the title of my sermon for today. Silencing day and night accusers. Did you know the Bible talks about accusers that fall into that category? Get ready. You're going to be greatly informed by the word of God. Do me a favor. Notify a friend, notify a neighbor, and share the link of the platform that you are listening or watching us on so they also can come and be blessed like you will surely be blessed. Everyone needs to hear this because it is a reality that we all face sometimes on a daily basis. And there are some of you that are watching me right now, you are going through what I'm talking about. There's an accusation flying around concerning you in the extended family, in the immediate family, on the job, in the church, in the neighborhood. I want to show you the reality of it and I want to show you how to get released from the power of day and night accusers. But before I do, I have some announcements as usual. I hope you don't get tired of me. First of all, I would like to invite you again to check us out on my podcast, Bishop Etiola's podcast. You can access that podcast by downloading my podcast app on the Google Play Store. For those of you that use the Android phone, or you can listen directly on the Spreaker app which can be downloaded for both the Android and the Apple phone. Spreaker is spelled S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. Come and join listeners from over 50 countries around the world that have downloaded over 90,000 episodes. You heard me right, we're climbing to 100,000. Glory to God. I implore all of you to please tell others about this broadcast. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on MixLR, and of course we're on television in the Caribbean islands. The great country of Guyana, we're on RBS TV 13 every Saturday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. local time. And also in 23 Caribbean island countries through Mercy and Truth TV, located in Jamaica. We're on every Saturday from 2.30 to 3.30 local time in the afternoon. And they put us on on Wednesday mornings also at 1.30 a.m. A big, big thank you to them. And also to the owners of Logic One TV Channel 112 in Jamaica. Three times a week we are on. A couple of other times a week they put us on. The prayers we pray every Thursday and every Friday right here in New York City. May God bless the owners of these stations. May God bless the employees also. May you continue to increase. And may the coast that you are in expand to greater heights and greater depths. Please don't forget also to listen to our own radio station, Fresh Waves Radio. We are on 24-7. It's an internet radio station where we bring you a variety of programming that's been a blessing to many people and I'm sure will be a blessing to you also. Fresh Waves Radio. You can download the app for both the Android and the Apple phones from their respective app stores. It's free. We don't charge anything for it. Just type Fresh Waves Radio, install the app, 
you are good to go into an experience that will really be a blessing to you. Help us spread the word and let others know. And don't forget this Thursday and this Friday, I will be leading prayers from New York City on the names of God. We've looked at, I uh, believe, four names of God already and it, it's, it's going places. People are being blessed praying the names of God. We're going to continue until we exhaust all the names of God. And the reason we do this is because whoever God says he is, that's what he does. That's how he presents himself to you. And you can take his name to him and say, Jehovah, this is you. This is your name. Be to me who you are. That's what we do every Thursday and every Friday, 7 p.m. New York time. It will be worth your while to join us. This week, you will be blessed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I bring myself before you, realizing I have nothing to share with your people except that which you help me to share. I pray you give me the anointing to speak, the freedom to speak, and bless your people through these lips of clay. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said amen. Silencing day and night accusers. You heard me right. My scriptures in the book of Revelation chapter 12. I'm reading in verse number 10. This is what it says. I heard a loud voice. And this guy will be loud. In heaven. Now is come salvation and strength. And the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before God day and night. Wow! The accuser of our brethren accused our brethren before God day and night. Now those words were spoken by the saints in heaven and they are referring to the saints on earth, you and myself. Their description of what is going on regarding us, seriously, is very, very troubling. We, you and I, and every saint of God, in every church, in every nation, in every city, around the world, the Bible tells us we are accused day and night before our Heavenly Father. The devil goes on. He doesn't go before God to worship. Uh -uh. He doesn't go before God to adore. He doesn't go before God to praise and honor God. No. Whenever you read that Satan goes before God, it is for one purpose. And one purpose alone, to bring all kinds of accusations against the saints of God. I will go into details of why he accuses us and what he accuses us for as I go on today. Countless are the methods that the enemy uses in bringing accusations against us. He can choose to accuse you directly by himself or he can choose to make your life miserable by hiring people to come up with all kinds of accusations against you. Now that second strategy of using people to accuse us is one that you and I have been exposed to over and over and over again. And you know what? It is very painful. If I ask many of you that are watching me right now or that are listening to me right now, how many of you have been wrongly accused before? I can guarantee it. Virtually all hands will be up. We've all been victims of accusations mostly false, maybe sometimes true. False accusations 
are generally packaged in a way to damage you most. Devastating effects is what the enemy goes after. And we have all endured it. We have all endured the pain. We have all endured the agony, the anxiety, the depression, the loss, the separation, the misunderstanding, the destruction of reputation, oh, the sleepless nights, and sometimes the warfare that accompanies false accusations. Unknown to us, many times, the one that is behind those accusations that they bring against us is the one that the saints in heaven sang about in the passage of scripture that I just read. He not only directly accuses us to God, but I repeat, he also hires humans like you, like me, to bring brutal accusations against us here on earth. Saints gone before us <laughs> have experienced these accusations. And I can just keep you for the rest of this sermon and just share with you scripture upon scripture upon scripture of people that fell into the hands of these wicked accusations. For example, Paul the Apostle. He wrote in Romans chapter 3 in verse number 7, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather, listen to the next statement in parenthesis, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come. What? Whose damnation is just. Can you see that, people? They were slanderously reporting about Paul the Apostle. Some of his enemies were saying that he said, let us do evil, that good may come. And Paul said, me? With all that I preached, I will open my mouth and say, let us do evil that good may come, God forbid. But that was what they accused him of. And he stuck, even though it's not the truth. False accusations, day and night. In Acts chapter 24, we read in verse number 5, And we have found this man, listen to what they found him for a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of a sect of the Nazarenes. What a lie. What a false accusation. Who have gone about to profane the temple? Ah, ah, whom we took and will have judged according to our law. Brethren, can you imagine what they were accusing the man of God of? That's false accusations. And I can imagine the man shaking his head and saying, Me? Profaning the temple? Where did you find that in my record? But that's the way the world is. The enemy will incite people directly to lie against you. Look at Stephen. And you know about him in Acts chapter 6. In verse number 8. And Stephen, or Steve, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So far, so good. Then, the Bible tells us, there arose of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia disputing with Stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they called men up which said, 
We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and caught him and brought him before the temple and set up false witnesses. Lord have mercy. Which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. When was he said? Where was he said? They couldn't prove that, but that was what they said. Accusations. For we have heard him say, can you hear that? Something that never came out of his mouth. That this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses has delivered to us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as he had been the face of an angel. But because of that accusation, he was stoned. Because of those accusations, he was killed. Now that's the extent to which accusations can go. It can lead to someone losing their job. It can lose to someone losing their family. It can lead to someone losing their friends. Day and night accusers. They are everywhere. Of course, David had his own share too. From day and night accusers. Because he said in Psalm 35, verse 11, he said, false witnesses. Did you hear that? They were witnesses, all right. But David said, they were not true witnesses. They were false witnesses. He said, false witnesses did rise up. And you better mark those words. False witnesses will rise up against me. They will rise up against you. And they laid my charge, they laid to my charge things that I knew not. That was what David said. Things that I knew not. They laid them to my charge. False accusers. And no wonder the saints in heaven cried out that our brethren on earth, this Satan through his schemes and through his agents, accused them day and night. Look at what David said. Because I told you, this accusation sometimes will result in devastating consequences. In Psalm 35 and verse number 12, they rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. In verse 20 he said, for they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. That was David. And believe me, it's you and I also. In 1 Samuel chapter 24 verse 9, we read what David said to Saul. And David said unto Saul, this was when Saul was chasing him all over the place. He said, Wherefore hearest thou men's words? You see, men will say things so as to get positions, so as to get favors. They will say all kinds of things against you, saying, David seeketh thy hurt. Did David ever do that? No. But the devil inspired these people to lie to Saul about David. And you know, most of the problems between Saul and David were incited by this, his own countrymen. And it came to pass after this in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. Here is another one. This one is deep, folks. After this, that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanon, his son, reigned in his stead. Okay, daddy is dead, son is on the throne. So a good man, David, in verse 2 of 2 Samuel chapter 10, and then said, David, I will show kindness unto Hanon, the son of Nahash, for his father showed me kindness. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants, for his father and David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. So far, so good. And the princes of the children, this is where the trouble starts. The princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanun their Lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father? Uh-uh. That he has sent comforters unto thee? No, no, no. Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? That's a false accusation. 
Wherefore, Hanan, look at the effect of these accusations. You need to pray. You can't stop people from accusing you, but you need to pray constantly that whatever they accuse you of will not stand. Wherefore, Hanan, believe what they said. Two David's servant shaved off half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and send them away. Wow. Based on false accusation. Look at Nehemiah who went to the land to do a good work for God. Look at what happened in verse 6 of chapter 6. Wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashem said it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel. That's not true. To which cause thou buildest the wall. That's not true. That thou mayest be their king. That's not true. According to these words. Have you ever had people accuse you to your face and you're saying, what? This is not true. I didn't say that. I didn't do that. Even people will look at your motive and they will misjudge your motive. False accusers. Accusing the saints. Day and night. Of course you know we have to read about Jesus when we talk about false accusations because he suffered it from the beginning to the end of his life. In Matthew chapter 12 verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. What? You mean Jesus was using demons <laughs> to cast out demons? And the chief priests in chapter 14 verse 55 and all the councils sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witnesses agreed not together. But did they kill him or did they not kill him? Of course they did. So we're talking about something very serious today. Something that you have experienced, something that I have experienced. And unfortunately, something that will always be around us. Until we see Jesus face to face. Look at Joseph. You know about Joseph, don't you? With all the foolishness that his brothers did to him, he found himself in Potiphar's house. What happened to this young, godly man? Listen, you don't have to be ungodly to be falsely accused. In fact, the more, un the more godly you are, the more you'll be falsely accused. So Joseph, a godly fearing man, a God fearing man, in chapter 39, verse 11. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And Potiphar's wife caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So, what happened in verse 13? And it came to pass when he saw that he had left his garment in his hand and was fled forth. Look at what she did. She called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew and Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice, and it came to pass. When he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got out. And she laid up his garment with her until Potiphar came. Lie, lie, lie. False accusation, false accusation, false accusation. So when Potiphar came, what happened? In verse 17, she spake unto him according to those words, saying, the Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant, did thy servant unto me. And his wrath was kindled. Joseph's master took him. What did he do to him? He put him in prison. 
a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. What did he do wrong? Nothing. What sin did he commit? None. Accusers can end up putting you in prison. Did you know how many people today are in jail who actually never did anything wrong? I've seen many people in New York City and all over the United States who will be released and the government will apologize to them that they were wrongly accused. They were thrown to jail for years, sometimes 30 years, sometimes 35 years for an offense they never committed simply because of false accusation. Maybe you have even gone to prison and you are out angry with humanity, I pray you will find in your heart to forgive those that falsely accused you because God will always fight for those that are falsely accused. There are many other scriptures so I just don't have the luxury of time. I'm almost halfway through my sermon now. These scriptures and many scriptures that I've not even had time to read, they show one thing. That false accusation is real, false accusation is deadly. And there are people who falsely accuse you, they may not even know they are falsely accusing you because they are adding one and one together, they are adding two and two together, and they are making assumptions that you have done this, that you have done that, when in actual fact, they have not got their facts correct. It makes people weep, it makes people cry, in fact, it makes people commit suicide. So before I go further, let's make some declarations. I just feel we need to do this. Let's make some declarations that are also real declarations. Seven decrees that I want us to make against the prosperity of accusations against you. They can make the accusation. But God can make them not to prosper. And that's what the, this decrees are for. You ready? I decree for you. Just say amen. I decree for you. In the name of Jesus Christ. That all accusations designed to trigger warfare against your life shall not prosper. Did I hear an amen? Amen. Let me make the second decree for you. A decree also for you that all accusations that are designed to prolong warfare against your life shall not prosper in the name of Jesus. Did I hear an amen to that also? God bless you for that. My next decree, I decree also that all accusations designed to destroy your destiny shall not prosper. In the name of Jesus. Did I hear an amen to that? You're doing good. I also have another declaration for you. That all accusations designed to make your superiors dislike you shall not prosper. In the name of Jesus. Did I hear an amen to that declaration? Let me go forward. All accusations that are designed to make people doubt you, they shall not prosper in the name of Jesus. All accusations that are designed to damage and destroy your reputation shall not prosper in the name of Jesus. All accusations that are designed to incite hatred against your life they shall not prosper in the name of Jesus my prayer for you today is very simple that all these seven decrees that are made shall be established in your life without fail in the name of the Father in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Ghost I have more to share I have more to share about day and night accusers. But first, let me read my text again. In Revelation chapter 12, 
in verse number 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. That's the good thing about this thing. The one that accused you will, will accuse you will eventually be cast down. And I pray that even now, those who are raising false accusations against you, that God will cast them down before you. It says, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Never forget what I told you. When the devil goes before God, he doesn't go to worship him. When the devil goes before God, he doesn't go to adore him. When the devil goes before God, he doesn't go to honor him. He goes to bring false accusations against the people of God. Now allow me to show you the three major ways that the accuser of the brethren seeks to accuse them before God day and night. But I will also show you before I close the two ways by which you can silence this accuser. Yes, you can. By the way, it might interest you to know that the first attempt, and I call it attempt, I call this accusation an attempt. I call it attempt because it always fails, never fails to fail. If that is good English. The first attempt that the enemy makes is this. Is to try and accuse the brethren of what they did when they served him. You know, he knew us. We knew him. He knew what we did. We knew what he asked us to do. Unfortunately for the accuser, that never flies before God. Accusing us of what we did <laughs> when we served him is a waste of time. The reason is this. If we have repented of our sins, no record of those sins, no record of those mistakes exists in heaven. It's all done, wiped out, clean. You know why I said that? Romans chapter 8 verse 33 tells us very clearly who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. So if I'm justified, where is the condemnation? You are just wasting your time. I cannot be condemned for what God has forgiven. Satan cannot successfully accuse anyone for sins already atoned for. For sins already confessed, hallelujah, and for sins already forgiven. My friends, yes, maybe you sinned. And the enemy is trying to accuse you. Shake it off. After all, you've confessed it. You are not living in need again. God has forgotten it. God has forgiven it. Move on and live a righteous life. You know, that is why the Jewish rabbis have a legend that says that Satan is compelled to refrain from accusations against Israel and keep silence on one day of the year. Yeah, the rabbis say that. <laughs> that there is a day in the year, one day in the year, that the accuser of the brethren cannot open his mouth to accuse uh, the Israelites. You know what that day is? The day of atonement. <laughs> they said on the day of atonement, that's just a legend as a belief that they have, that on the day of atonement, the great day of atonement, Satan cannot say a word for anything that they have done. Even though it's a mere legend, it indicates something. It indicates some true perception of the only ground on which the charge of guilt before God can be successfully met through atonement. If your sin has been atoned for, if you have confessed them and you are forsaken them, don't worry about what the devil says. He's just wasting his time. 
Having said that though, you realize that if the devil cannot accuse us for sins that are forgiven, it is then very obvious that the next thing he does is to accuse us of our actual sins. Yes. The sins that are forgiven, he cannot accuse you of. But the sins, the actual sins that have been committed, oh yes, he will accuse you of that. I want to plead with you today. Please, listen to Bishop. Let no man deceive you. Sin is very costly. Don't let anyone tell you you can still go on living in sin, living in sin. If anyone is going to teach you that you can continue living in sin, they should also teach you that the devil will continue successfully accusing you before God. That is why you should wage war against every sin that dominates your life. Sin gives the enemy the right to accuse you before God and justify whatever he chooses to do against you. That's right. That is why our conscience under the influence of the Holy Spirit never lets us rest when we do wrong. If you listen to the Holy Spirit of God, and make your way right. You know what you do? You shut out Satan's accusations and his plans against you. You shut them down. Our problem is failure to repent. Our failure to repent, when the Holy Spirit desires to correct us, what it does is that it opens the door for the accuser to condemn us. Second Samuel tells us about David in chapter 12, in verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also has put away thy sin, and thou shalt not die. But look at the next statement. It's loaded with truth. How be it? Because by this deed, listen now, Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And the number one enemy of the Lord and the number one enemy that you have is Satan. The child also that is born to thee shall surely die. So he told David, he said, what you did, you've given the enemy the right of way to say all kinds of nonsense and accuse you before God and before man. And do you know what? Up till today. The enemy is still using that incident against David and against believers at large. Do you now see how subtle and how merciless Satan really, really is? Let me show you what I mean. Before we sin, he is busy tempting us. He is busy whispering. You can get away with this. Come on, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Then after we do it, he shouts at us and he says, you will never get away with this. You will never get away with this. The voice of the enemy, ladies and gentlemen, never offers hope nor extends grace for repentance. May I repeat that? The voice of the enemy never offers any hope nor extend grace for repentance. The only way to defeat the enemy in this arena is to disarm him by sincerely repenting of any sin that is present in your life. Looking again to the atonement of Christ as the sum of all our righteousness. The Bible tells us these things are right that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate now. Go to the advocate and settle it because unconfessed sin, people, is a great weapon in the hand of the enemy. Can I repeat that? Unconfessed sin is a great weapon 
in the hand of the enemy. The wise Solomon said this in Proverbs chapter 28 in verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Can I repeat that? He that covereth his sin will not prosper. And one of the ways it will not prosper is because the accuser of the brethren will come banging at the doors of heaven, accusing him to God, accusing him to man. But, he says, whoso confesses and forsakes his sin shall have mercy. Now you will think that sin having led somebody into sin <laughs> will then leave him to suffer the consequences of the sin. But that's not what happens. You know what happens? Satan has one more strategy that can make the disobedient Christian doubly defeated. You know what it is? Accusation. Now don't forget now, he's the one that tempted you to sin. He's the one that tempted you to do wrong. And then he will turn around <laughs> and start accusing you. To Abraham, so see what Abraham did. He lied about his wife. To David, see what David did. Don't you see it? He committed adultery with his neighbor's wife. And then he killed her husband. God, judge him, judge him, judge him. And then he goes about Peter. God, why are you listening or why are you not? Did you hear how Peter cursed and how he swore and denied your son three times? Are you going to let him get away with that? That is the modus operandi of the accuser of the brethren. He will come and knock you and knock your sin as if he never knew anything about it before you committed it. Yeah, the accuser. Of the brethren. But there's another weapon that this chief of demons uses against us is to bring up our past mistakes and our poor decisions. They, are not, they may not necessarily be sins, they may be just mere mistakes and poor decisions and poor choices that you made. And you realize this each one of us, you and I, we have an inherent propensity towards ignorance, all right? One does not have to read far into the history of the saints to discover that they were called not because of their wisdom, no. We didn't have wisdom when we were called and we had made some serious mistakes, wrong judgment. I'm not talking about sin this time. In truth, we all have made mistakes, hopefully, we have at least learned from them and developed humility because of them. But the enemy will still use them against us. The fault-finding demon takes our past mistakes. And you know what it does? He parades them before our memory, criticizing our efforts to do God's will, keeping us in bondage to the past. When the devil reminds him, you of your past, Remind him of his future. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? When the devil reminds you of your past, don't forget to remind him of his future. He's going to burn in hell forever and ever and ever. Let me go to the third. Another strategy the enemy uses to accuse the brethren is when he tells outright lies against them before God. You know, he's the father of lies. He did it to Job. Look at the book of Job chapter 1. I'm reading there in verse number 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. He didn't come to worship. He didn't come to adore God. He came for accusation. I told you. He goes to and fro to do nothing but to accuse. 
In verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance and his increase in the land. But you, God, put forth his hand now, touch all that he has, and it will curse you to your face. Ah! Satan, you are bad. So Satan accuses us. Look at what he accused him of. Is what he accuses you of, and is what he accuses me of. Satan accuses us that we are self-seekers. He does. That we are not serving him for nothing. That the only reason we got saved is because of the blessings we seek to get from him. Those were the things he accused Job of before God. That the only reason we keep serving him is so as to preserve those blessings. You know what makes me glad though? You can't fool God. God does not buy all that nonsense that the devil orders before him against us. God knows us. He knows our motives. He knows our intentions. But trust me, he will go and lie against you before God. Why am I, why I'm not so glad though is how we buy all the nonsense that the devil utters against us. That's the only thing that saddens me today. We buy all that nonsense that he whispers in our ears. We believe what he says, even about our forgiving sins. And many of us will not forgive ourselves, even though God has forgiven us. I can mention names of people that I know who ended up killing themselves for sins that God has forgiven them of. I know of a pastor of a Pentecostal church, a well-known man of God, a strong man of God, who at a moment of weakness sinned. And then he caught himself after he sinned and said, me, I did that. God, I'm so sorry for what I did. What a bad boy I am. Well, the devil came to him and accused him. What about all the sermons you have preached? Look at what you did. What about all the people now that are looking at you and will not be Christians? This is very bad. And this pastor, I almost mentioned his name, in the United States, went and bought a gun, left his suicide note, and killed himself. He did. He did. We believe the nonsense that the devil says about us. We believe the nonsense that it makes other people to say about us. We are unable to move forward in the righteousness that God has given us when we got restored. We believe what he says about our present sins. We believe what he says about our past mistakes. We believe what he says about our motives for serving God. You know what? It even looks like God has more confidence in us than we have in ourselves. Can I repeat that? It looks like God has more confidence in you and I than we have in ourselves because we believe the accusations of Satan than the approvers of God. Can I repeat that? We believe the accusations of Satan more than the approvers of God. What he says about our past mistakes, we believe them. What he says about our sins, we believe them. And it's just too bad. Well, i got about seven more minutes. How then do we overcome day and night demonic accusers? You can't stop them from accusing you because that's their job. How do we overcome them? we we'll find the answer in Revelation chapter 12, in verse number 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. 
For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Book of verse 11. This is so beautiful. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him. Isn't that beautiful? By the blood of the Lamb, glory to God, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives even unto death. They overcame him. Can I say something to you? You also will overcome him. Whether it's in your family or it's in your church or it's your neighborhood or it's on your job that they are that have leveled all kinds of accusations against you, you can overcome them and the devil that is behind them. You will end up being an overcomer. Let me read it to you again. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, number one, and they overcame him by the word of their testimony. The blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. Let me begin with the last one. What is the testimony of the saints? It is a testimony concerning the blood of the Lamb. It is a testimony about how he saved them, how he washed them, how he cleansed them, how he made them redeemed. If ever we are to conquer this accuser of the brethren, then we need to testify. We need to testify. We need to testify. We need to testify to the world about what the blood has done in our lives. You will not know, you will not believe it, how powerful that is. Another way to put that is we need to preach the gospel. If you're looking for an incentive to preach the gospel today, is that it helps you in silence and saving. Let me show you what I mean. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, the Bible says, Stand therefore, having thy loins God about with truth, talking about how you overcome uh, the devil and having on the breastplate of righteousness and for your feet let it be shot listen to this now with the preparation of the gospel of peace what it's listing a long list giving a long list of what and what you need to do as your weapons you need to have as your weapons against the devil and then in verse 15 it says your feet must be shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now you read that and you say, wait a minute, how sharing your testimony of what the blood has done in your life, what does it have to do with overcoming the devil? Well, here the Bible says it, that it's a powerful weapon against the devil and against his false accusations. How come it is so? I have no idea. But I know this as an African. And if you're watching me today and you're an African, you know this is to be the truth. I have seen people in Africa under great spiritual warfare. Eh? They get told to go and do morning cry. Morning cry is when you go to the neighborhoods and preach the gospel early in the morning before the break of day. You tell them, give your life to Jesus, come to the Lord, and so on and so forth. And from that experience, I have heard from people who did that, how they've got victories as a result of sharing their testimony, of telling people to give their lives to Jesus like they did. Just by doing that, victory came. Why does it happen? I don't know. But I don't have to know. If the Bible says the word of your testimony does it, huh? then it works. But beyond pleading with people to surrender their hearts and to surrender their lives to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, you and I know that it is also a known fact that the enemy is stopped in his tracks 
when you plead the blood of Jesus against him. He just doesn't know how to handle it. Now, I'm a deliverance minister, and we have done scores of deliverances for people. And when we get to a point where we don't know what to do again, we just begin to sing, Oh, the blood of Jesus. The moment you start singing, Oh, the blood of Jesus, the devil just gets wild and says, Shut up! I don't want to hear about that blood. There is something about the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is grace and glory in the blood of Jesus. The enemy is stopped in his tracks as you plead the blood of Jesus. If you are sick, plead the blood of Jesus. If anyone is going around spreading rumors about you, plead the blood of Jesus. If your neighbors and your in-laws are talking foolishness against you, just plead the blood of Jesus. Whatever happens, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. And remember what he told them in the book of Exodus. When I see the blood, or maybe I should say when I hear the sound of the blood coming out of the mouth of those who have the sign of the blood upon their forehead, I will do something about those who falsely accuse you. Let me summarize, even as I close. If you are going to overcome day and night accusers, and we're talking spiritual here, I submit to you, number one, there is an accuser out there who takes your case before God day and night. Only God knows how many times my name has come up in the courts of heaven. Only God knows how many times your name has come up in the courts of heaven. But the good thing is this, he cannot use your confessed sins against you. Uh -uh. He cannot use the sins that God has forgiven, he cannot use them against you. They are underneath the blood. But if we continue in sin, we give him a right to accuse us before God and before man and obtain right to do us harm. So don't play with sin. But don't worry about the lies. He will also tell against you before God that you are self-seeking, that you are nothing but user of God. God never buys any of those accusations, so you don't need to worry. How do we overcome him? Very simple. By pleading the blood of Jesus against him. And also by sharing your testimony of what the blood has done in your life. And what it can do in their lives. I pray for you that as you go off the air today, great victory shall be your portion. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come before your people to bring the word. I pray that the words that they have heard will liberate them and set them free and give them the victory over false accusers. I bind the mouths that are going up and down and down about you. May the Lord give you the victory over them. We plead the blood of Jesus against them. And as you do all these things, may God respond by giving you instantaneous answer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be back again next week. Until then, may God deliver you from accusers of the brethren. Bye-bye.